Uh, so it's a great pleasure for me to be introducing uh, Phoebe Vallonas, uh, who's an assistant professor in the Industrial and Systems Engineering and Computer Science Department at University of Southern California. Uh, so it seems like you have more responsibilities than that these days, Phoebe. <laughs> also Associate Director of the Center for Artificial Intelligence and Society. Uh, she has an NSF Career Award and uh, the uh, an award which is called the Informs Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Ambassador Program Award. Her research is in optimization, artificial intelligence, machine learning, but uh, special, special interest for fairness, interpretability and robustness. I've seen some of her work in, uh, involved with applications such as homelessness, uh, I, I think organ allocation, but she also get, is involved in substance use and suicide prevention. So she's really our good, good OR practice person. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Phoebe, for accepting to give this talk today. We're I'm looking forward to hearing the, the content. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Eric, for uh, organizing. Thanks also, of course, to Walter and Fabian uh, for, uh, for organizing everything. And um, I'm very grateful also for the invitation. I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to be here and share a little bit of, uh, of the work in our group. Uh, so I had promised a slightly different talk um, but uh, don't worry, I'm going to talk about that as well, just talk a, a little bit about other things as well. In particular, I'm not only going to talk about social services uh, intervention, but also about uh, conservation today. Um, so I'm not able to change slides. Okay. So just as a bit of background, so as Eric mentioned, I am Associate Director of CASE, the Center for AI in Society at USC. Uh, so this is an interdisciplinary research center between the schools of engineering and social work. Uh, so basically a lot of our uh, projects are actually collaborative with uh, researchers in the School of Social Work uh, and, uh, and the center involves students both from the engineering side, in particular industrial and systems engineering and computer science, uh, and, and students in social work specializing in things like homelessness, substance use, uh, suicide prevention, and so on. So a lot of the work that we do is trying to revisit those interventions that are conducted in social work, but from an engineering perspective, right? So using techniques of data science, operations research, AI, and so on. Ultimately, though, the research approach that we take is use-inspired. So what do I mean by this? That basically most of the questions we tackle in operations research, in optimization in particular, and most relevant uh, to this workshop in optimization under uncertainty, ultimately have the goal of being deployed. So uh, we work very closely with uh, community partners and policymakers throughout our project and come up with research questions in our own field, right? Uh, so problems that you know, need advances in OR uh, to be able to be solved, but ultimately we want these advances to translate to immediate um, benefits for society by basically being involved in this deployment phase as well. So today I'd like to uh, tell you about uh, two of our projects. Um, the first one is concerned with uh, designing policies for allocating housing to people experiencing homelessness. And in particular, the main um, problem that I'm going to be concerned with here is trying to design policies that align with the moral value judgments of policymakers. Um, this is an important problem in general in, in AI, right? How to elicit moral value judgments. Um, it's also a problem in marketing and, uh, and in OR. Um, um, but here, the advances we're going to make, um, our hope is to directly uh, put them uh, to practice to help design policies that are going to meet the needs of our policymakers. In the second part of my talk, I'm going to be talking about biodiversity conservation, so very different. This is going to be uh, working collaboration with a conservation organization and trying to figure out how to uh, choose which parcels of land to protect uh, to help uh, preserve biodiversity. So the motivation uh, for this uh, first project that I mentioned is the homelessness crisis in LA. Uh, uh, the situation is quite tragic. We have currently in LA County over 66,000 persons experiencing homelessness and only 21,000 housing units. So this means that we need to be very thoughtful about how we prioritize or how we, uh, how we prioritize people for these scarce resources or how we allocate these uh, very scarce resources to, to people experiencing homelessness. An additional challenge, right? Something we need to be thoughtful about as we, as we decide how we're gonna be prioritizing people 
is that there are severe uh, inequities in, in housing. So, uh, for example, Black people uh, are a group that is disproportionately affected by homelessness. Um, in LA currently, they represent 40% of the homeless population and only 9% of the general population. So really, they're far more affected. And as we decide how we're going to be allocating resources to people experiencing homelessness, certainly we want to be thinking about equity and about making sure that you know, we don't increase existing uh, uh, injustices. So for this work, we're partnering with the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, which is the entity in charge of allocating housing resources in LA. And I'm working in particular very closely with Eric Rice, who's co-director of CASE, an expert in homelessness. So he's a professor in the School of Social Work. Um, uh, and um, and he, has, he has long-standing collaborations actually with LASA, with whom I've also been working for the past now four years, probably. So this is us uh, at LASA meeting with policymakers, uh, coordinators of, uh, of the system, and so on. So in one of our first meetings, we tried to discuss uh, with, with, with policymakers what it is that they would like this, uh, the policy for allocating housing to be doing. So the first thing that came out is that they're really not happy about how things are currently done. They think that the system is not transparent because there are several decision makers that come into that affect, that, that impact the policy that's currently in place. Um, and and so, 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 so there is a, a clear need for improvement. They also are very disappointed that um, there is the feeling that the current system is very inequitable. So there was a need both for evaluating how the current system is working, but also for having a system that's going to uh, overcome the shortcomings of, of how things are currently done. And in particular, there's three aspects or three concerns that we discussed with them. So the first one, which I mentioned, is this idea of interpretability, that we'd like the system to be very transparent about why someone receives a resource as compared to somebody else. We'd like also the system to be very efficient, of course. This is something that as operations researchers is probably the first thing we think about, which is, you know, we'd like to make the best possible use in some sense of these resources. So one idea would be to track uh, outcomes under a particular policy, for example, who returns, uh, um, sorry, the number of people that return to homelessness uh, after being allocated a resource or trying to minimize the number of people that return to homelessness and so on. Of course, given the inequities I also discussed earlier, there's serious concerns about fairness. Um, and there, you know, there's a lot of debate about what uh, fairness actually means. We may consider, uh, we may think about fairness in the allocation. So, you know, um, uh, we'd like, for example, the number of, um, the, the chance of getting a resource of any given type if you're black or white to be approximately equal, or we may think, you know, we're okay to have disparities in the allocation if ultimately this results in fair outcomes. So obviously these are things that are not necessarily compatible with one another. And similarly, the more fairness requirements I impose on my system, the more I'm gonna have to pay a price in terms of efficiency and interpretability and vice versa. There's a, so there's this kind of multiple objectives of what we want from this system, right? And a lot of people have many expectations about what we'd like the system to be doing, yet there's no consensus about how we should be trading off these conflicting objectives. And it seems that this is a recurrent problem in, um, in a, current, a, a recurrent item of discussion among policymakers at LASA. So uh, you guys have probably heard of something uh, uh, called the MIT Moral Machine. Um, so in the MIT Moral Machine, what do they do? They're, um, uh, they, they, they consider the problem of deciding how um, self-driving cars should act in certain uh, morally difficult situations, right? So for example, if you need to decide if you're gonna have to uh, drive over a baby or, uh, or swerve and, uh, and hit an old person and things like that. So we want somehow to have automated systems that make decisions like a human would do in some sense, right? And so what we're trying to do here is precisely use this idea of preference elicitation, similar to the uh, AI moral machine, to try and understand the moral value judgments of our policymakers to be able to make ultimately a recommendation for them for a policy that's going to meet their needs and trade off these conflicting objectives in a way that, uh, that is suitable. 
So trying to apply this idea in this context, um, how that would work is the following. We, we propose to show um, different policies. Here I'm focusing on outcomes, but certainly we could also look at certain interpretability uh, properties of our policy and ask the policymakers to make decisions in terms of which one they prefer. So a simple example goes as follows. On the left here, I'm showing a policy that's kind of unfair in terms of its outcomes, right? You have very different chance of exiting homelessness depending on your race. And in particular, communities that have been traditionally marginalized have lower chance of exiting homelessness. And in addition, um, but, but however, this policy is quite efficient. Like for any given individual, they have a quite high chance of exiting homelessness. On the other hand, we have policy B here, who is super fair in terms of its outcomes at least, um, but then it's less efficient. So now by telling you to choose which one uh, of these two policies you prefer, I can learn something about your moral value judgments, right? How much efficiency you're willing to trade in for fairness and so on. The issue, of course, where uh, kind of the, the research problem comes in is that we have a huge number of possible questions we could ask about and not enough time. So more or less, uh, based on preliminary experiments we have conducted on Amazon Mechanical Turk, in order for someone to make a decision between a pairwise comparison, basically to decide uh, if they prefer option A, option B, or if they're indifferent, it takes about 13 to 15 seconds. The problem is a little bit more complicated than what I showed you before. There's kind of more dimensions that we're looking at, so it takes more time. So, you know, if you have, I don't know, 20 candidate policies, even which is not a huge number, right? Asking all the possible pairwise comparisons is really time consuming. So we really need to be strategic about which pairwise comparisons we ask about, all right? So, um, so before telling you about our actual elicitation approach, which will try to determine the queries, let me just give a little bit of um, uh, the building blocks of our model, okay? And don't hesitate to, um, to ask questions in the chat or to interrupt me if you have questions. So um, first of all, we need to characterize somehow in our model the performance in terms of interpretability, efficiency, and fairness of our policy. So basically think of this as a, as a data set. Each row is going to be a policy, and each column is going to be a feature of that policy. OK, so for example, I could say my policy is a decision tree. It has depth four. Um, it, uh, its outcomes uh, for white people is like 80% uh, chance of exiting homelessness. Outcomes overall are, you know, 70% or something. Uh, and, so, and so we collect all these covariates in this vector, okay? Now we have all these candidate policies. Uh, let's say we have I of them. What we can do is pick uh, a pair of policies and ask our policymaker to decide which one they prefer. Uh, so basically we need to select in this comparison set uh, 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 an, an element, so, to, so, so a, a pair of policies. And then our policymaker is going to respond, I kind of prefer uh, item one, item two, or, uh, or I'm indifferent. Ultimately, what's our goal is to select the questions in a way that we're going to be able to make a recommendation for our user, for our policymaker, that's going to be as good as possible. So we could select uh, this recommendation set could be uh, uh, take the form of a finite set of candidate policies that are possible to deploy. It could be a polyhedral set or it could be a polyhedral set inter intersected with some integrality constraints, for example. Ultimately, we just want to recommend one policy. So this, this is not a ranking problem or anything. We really want to just find the best one. So uh, naturally, in this context, we need to model user preferences somehow. For this presentation, I'm going to assume that the user is rational, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we relax this assumption in practice. This is just to simplify here my presentation and to avoid uh, a lot of overload in notation. Um, and we assume that we can represent the user preferences using an unknown utility function, which is going to map the covariates of our policies to a real number. Now, if uh, in this perfectly rational setting, if the user tells us, I prefer policy X over policy Y, this really means their utility for X is greater than their utility for Y. If they say they're indifferent, it means that the two utilities are the same. 
In terms of our model of uncertainty for the preferences, so here the challenge we have, right, is that our utility function is unknown. We propose to follow, in order to model this uncertainty, an approach by, at, at this point, really common in the literature, both the literature on AI through the work of Boutillier, in the literature in marketing through the work of Tubia, and the literature on operations research through the work of Bertimas and O'Hare. We follow this idea that we don't model uncertainty in utilities through distributions, but rather through uncertainty sets. So we're gonna, our starting point is gonna be the set of all possible utilities that are compatible with some information that we may have to begin with, okay? We're also gonna work with the assumption that our utility function is linear in the utility function parameters. It could be non-linear in the features. Um, you can think of this, for example, as taking all the features on my policy and then building more sophisticated functions out of them to, uh, to kind of be able to model more difficult um, a, a, a behavior. Now, this assumption is also fairly common, both it's taken in the papers I mentioned, it's common uh, in uh, utility theory, in, um, a, uh, in choice model, uh, in choice models, I mean. In particular, when we model inconsistencies, and I'm skipping this notation here, we could just add an error term here and really recover our choice models from the literature. And this is what we do in practice to model inconsistency. And this is somewhat different than the previous papers I mentioned um, in the slide, in the previous slide, and I'm happy to discuss the differences um, and the reasons why we take this approach. Um, so now the issue we have here is that this vector u is unknown. And all we know is that it belongs in some uncertainty set, which we assume to be polyhedral. If I don't have any information about this uh, utility vector, I could say, for example, that it lies in the minus one, one box, or I could assume that it's been normalized in a way that all items, all policies uh, have a utility that lies between zero and one. Any questions so far? All right. So now let's try and understand what information I get as a byproduct of my queries. So again, I'm not discussing here how to uh, uh, select queries yet. I'll discuss that in a moment. So I'm taking a very simple illustration where we have two dimensions. So each policy has two elements. So my utility vector also lives in two dimensions. And I have three candidate policies, x1, x2, and x3. Now, when I ask a pairwise comparison, let's say I ask you to compare x1 and x2, really what I'm asking is some information about the quantity u transpose x1 minus x2. I'm asking you to tell me if it's positive or negative or zero, right? So let's say I ask you, do you prefer policy one or policy two? If you say I prefer policy one, it means your utility vector is up here. If you say x2, it's the opposite, right? So let's say you answer I prefer x1, and then um, I ask you another question, do you prefer X1 or X3? As I get more information, right, the uncertainty set progressively shrinks. So after two questions, we're in this dark, dark region here. So what's the critical point I wanna make here? That this uncertainty set, this updated one with the new information is gonna depend both on the queries, Yota, that I chose to ask you, and the answers S to the queries you gave me, okay? So here we're gonna have information that's going to depend on the queries I chose to ask. We can write this set analytically, of course. We can say that this updated uncertainty set is the original uncertainty set augmented with some constraint, constraints whose sign depends on the response I received from the user. Okay, a few comments here. We have strict inequalities here. Uh, of course, this uncertainty set will be decision dependent and dependent also on previous, on uncertainty seen in previous periods, okay? All right, now, once we um, uh, have observed the answers to the query, uh, the question is, how do we make recommendations? We can recommend uh, uh, items according to the maximum utility criterion by basically uh, trying to maximize the worst case uh, value of our utility function, or we could um, make recommendations according to min max regret, where we try to minimize the worst case of our regret, defined as the difference between the utility of the item I should have recommended and the utility of the item I actually recommended. 
some observations here, no matter which criterion we use, the worst case is taken over this uncertainty set that depends on the past queries and the past answers. In this talk, I'm going to focus on the top part. Um, also, I'm going to show results also, um, actually, I'm going to show results only on the min-max regret uh, part, just to confuse things. Uh, uh, if you want details on the theory of the min-max regret, I encourage you to look at the paper. All right, so, so far, we know how to, um, we, we, we know what happens after we have uh, asked queries and observed answers to the queries, we know how to make recommendations. The key question is, how do we choose the queries, right? This was the whole like uh, point of my introduction, but this is the, the hard question here. So we're going to investigate two elicitation procedures. One is offline, where we decide all queries up front. And one is online, where we decide queries uh, on the fly uh, in a way that can adapt to previous uh, questions and answers. So in the offline setting, right, we choose K queries to begin with, we observe the answers to the queries, and then we make a recommendation. This is suitable for paper-based surveys. The reason why we looked at this problem is in particular because we're interested in also eliciting the preferences of people with lived experience kind of going on the street. Uh, and so uh, it's more suited to have something that's paper-based and that we don't need to optimize on the fly. So let me uh, uh, first study this problem before turning to the online setting. So we can actually formulate this problem as what is often referred to as a two and a half stage problem. Why two and a half? Because we have two decision stages and two uncertainty stages. So it's a max min max min problem. In the first stage, we select the queries to ask from this comparison set. Then we observe the answers to the queries and then we solve the max min utility problem. Okay. Uh, what is this set? This set says that the user must somehow be Russian. They can't answer to questions randomly, right? Uh, uh, if, if they could just answer anything to any question, I wouldn't learn any information from what they give me. So somehow their choice of answers must be compatible with some utility vector in the uncertainty set. In the case of inconsistencies, this set can also capture the fact that they can be inconsistent, but in a way that's going to follow our model. Okay. It, why, what sets us apart relative to the previous literature on preference elicitation in this uncertainty set context is that our elicitation approach, the way in which we choose the queries to ask, integrates the, the, the choice of the queries with a downstream optimization problem. What do I mean by this? If I change the way in which I'm asking, I'm making recommendations, this is gonna change the, the questions I ask, right? So if I change the recommendation set, the, the set of possible queries I should make, it's gonna impact which queries are gonna be the most informative for me. In the existing literature, on the contrary, the way in which queries I, are made is to try and minimize uh, the size of the uncertainty set. Uh, in one way or another, and somehow this is not necessarily compatible with trying to make a good recommendation, even a good recommendation that's going to be robustly optimal. So let's now study a little bit of the complexity of this problem. So um, a few observations. Remember, this set involves strict inequalities. This set also, uh, if I go back to slides, my apologies, I know this is not good practice. If I go back here, remember this set is defined in this fashion, which is really like uh, difficult to work with. Um, however, what we show is that actually you can do the following. You can drop from here the dependence on Yota because intuitively it wouldn't be in the interest of the respondent to, re to, uh, to make a choice of responses that would result in an empty uncertainty set downstream. Uh, it also does not make sense to have indifference responses, so we can reduce the number of responses to two instead of three. The reason is intuitively that this set will always be smaller, quote unquote, uh, if we allow for indifference responses. Uh, and so, 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 so at least this challenge is overcome. It's also possible to show that we can relax the strict inequalities to be loose inequalities and uh, the set of optimal solutions will remain unchanged. Uh, however, 
Um, uh, and sorry, I, I skipped ahead. So, so let me discuss some uh, theoretical results on this problem. The first result is uh, a result on easiness of the problem. It states that if this recommendation set is convex, the problem will be polynomially solvable and there will not be any benefit in asking any questions. On the other hand, if um, this set is not convex, for example, it's a discrete set, evaluating the objective function of this problem will be empty hard. And this is true even if this set consists of only two items. However, so this motivates us actually to try and formulate the problem as a mixed binary LP using the four tricks I discussed with you just now. So following these tricks, remember, we now have a problem that's a max min, max min problem without dependence on Yota here and with this set involving only uh, uh, loose inequalities. We can dualize this in, and now we can follow standard robust optimization techniques after these four tricks. Basically, we dualize this inner problem, then we um, uh, we bring this minimization, uh, sorry, we bring this max, sorry, we have then a max min max problem. We can bring this max before the mean by just indexing all the decisions by S. Uh, and then uh, we have a max mean problem, but this mean is over a finite set. And so we can write it in epigraph form. And so this gives us the MBLP reformulation. This in principle can be solved using off the shelf solvers. The issue though, is that it has a huge number of decision variables and constraints that are exponential in the number of queries we asked. Although we have reduced the number of response scenarios, remember to only have I prefer A or I prefer B. So how do we deal with this exponentiality in the number of decision verbs and constraints? We propose a column and constraint generation approach. I'd like to point out that in this offline problem, speed is not super critical. However, it's still important when we're talking because here the number of scenarios is so large that we still need a method to speed things up. So we start with a relaxed main problem in the CCG procedure. It involves only a subset of the possible responses you can give me. And remember now this set does not depend on Yota, right? So uh, I can just impose it for all possible responses, even those that are inconsistent with any utility vector. By solving this problem, we obtain a, a Yota, which is a set of candidate queries. We plug these queries into a feasibility subproblem. This problem is an MILP, but in practice it solves really, really fast. And then we, uh, as a result of solving this feasibility subproblem, we either get a certificate that the set of queries we uh, fed in is optimal, or we obtain a violated scenario S that we can uh, uh, add to uh, S tilde here and iterate. And probably this approach converges and it results actually in significant uh, speed ups. Let me now turn to the online elicitation procedure. So in the online elicitation procedure, this is a problem that has been uh, more well studied, I would say in the literature. Uh, basically here we're asking questions over time, one, one at a time, uh, and we can uh, adapt our question at any period to the previous cho choices of questions and answers. So this is suitable when we have access to a computer uh, uh, and when we are happy to ask different questions for different individuals. This problem is of course very complicated because it would be a min max min max problem with decision dependent uncertainty sets um, and basically decision dependent uh, information discovery. So we propose to follow what is done in the literature which is to solve it greedily in some sense that we identify one question at a time as if it were the last question asked. The key difference though with the literature is that we're gonna select this one query optimally according to uh, our offline procedure. So it will still be this query as informative as possible under the assumption that it's the last one we ask. So let me now show you some uh, numerical results. I'm only going to show you results on real data and in particular on data from the homeless management information system. So. Um, the first step in order to, uh, uh, to, to, be, to be able to elicit the preferences of policymakers is to generate candidate policies. In order to generate these candidate policies, we have access to data from this homeless management information system that basically has records 
for each individual of their characteristics, XI, the treatment they received, which housing resource they got, PSA, permanent supportive housing, which is kind of the most supportive intervention, rapid rehousing, which is a shorter term thing, or just services. And then the outcome under the treatment they got. Okay, so whether they successfully exit homelessness or actually returned uh, within a given period of time. So a key challenge in working with this data is that it's uh, data collected in deployment. We, in particular, in deciding which treatment to assign to individuals, we, uh, um, the, the policymakers use the covariate information. However, we don't know what this mapping is. We don't know historically how they assigned actually treatment. Um, and what makes this hard is that basically those who received a particular housing resource, let's say a permanent supportive housing, they're going to differ a lot by those people who received rapid rehousing, right, and those who got nothing. Uh, this makes it somewhat difficult to estimate the counterfactual outcomes of what will happen to any given individual if they were to receive a different intervention than what they actually uh, got in the data. Uh, so, uh, how will we proceed to generate candidate policies and, uh, that are interpretable and to, um, uh, and to evaluate their performance? Uh, we are proposed to use an approach that uh, uh, we devised in another paper um, on learning optimal prescriptive trees. The idea here is the following. We want to design tree-based policies, so think of them like classification trees, where at the leaf nodes, instead of making a prediction, we assign a treatment. Using the framework in this, um, in this paper, we can actually optimize different objective functions. So um, um, we can optimize utility functions that are combinations of interpretability of our tree, fairness of our tree, and efficiency of our tree to generate candidate policies that have different goals. Okay. Now, with uh, this in mind, we uh, uh, will be able to evaluate our approach um, uh, uh, on the candidate policies we will have generated. In order to use that method, though, we need to estimate uh, the performance of a policy. And in order to do this, for example, in terms of its outcomes, and in order to do this, we need to have estimates of the propensity scores, meaning of the chance that an individual will get the treatment they actually got in the data and estimates of the outcomes uh, condition on being in a particular treatment group. Combining then these estimates, we'll be able to estimate the counterfactual performance of any given policy. So the next three slides are going to be about showing you uh, our learned models for the propensity score and for the conditional outcomes. Something to keep in mind, and I know I'm giving you a lot of information here, is that we'd like our models, so these are machine learning models for predicting, say, propensity scores or outcomes, should be fair. What do I mean by this? So here we're in a context of resource allocation, right? I want to understand, for example, the outcomes um, for different races, right? For white people or for black people in the system. Let's say that my machine learning model makes mistakes at different rates for white people and for black people. For example, let's say it overestimates the outcomes under no housing for black people. Then my system is going to give them fewer resources and be happy that it will have equal outcomes. So we need to use fair machine learning methods to ensure that we don't run in this kind of problem. So we use um, a, a, a recent uh, work of ours on learning optimal fair classification trees to try and uh, learn uh, those uh, propensity scores and outcomes. Uh, in a way that's both kind of that has both high accuracy while at the same time being fair. So here I'm showing to you the results for these propensity scores, which remember is the probability that you get the treatment you got in the data. In our model, we input a fairness bound, this equalized odds bound. The higher the bound, the more unfairness we are willing to tolerate. The lower the bound, the more fair we'd like our model to be. On the x-axis, we're showing equalized odds, which is basically the greatest value of the difference in equalized odds in terms of race, gender, and, um, and race uh, for all the, the groups. And then we show accuracy, which of course you're all familiar with. 
Now let me parse the colors on this graph. So here we have uh, in circles and triangles in sample and out of sample results. The circle and triangle that are empty correspond to CART, so the solution obtained just by running classification and regression trees, which as you can see is quite unfair. And now we see that as we tune our fairness bound, we can start to have using our framework, a model that is more and more fair. Initially, we sacrifice very little accuracy until ultimately we need to start having sacrificing a lot of accuracy to have fairness. So we picked the tree that is in this area, meaning that it has uh, it is as fair as possible while sacrificing very little accuracy, and this is what it looks like. So, for example, here you can see if I track one specific data point, let's say we have someone who uh, hasn't been in stable housing for a long time, so it's someone who's quite vulnerable and who has uh, uh, several uh, trimorbidity problems. Uh, then they are more likely to get the most supportive type of intervention. They have a 68% chance of getting permanent supportive housing. In a similar way, we learn the outcomes conditional on no treatment, conditional on receiving rapid rehousing, RRH, and conditional on receiving PSH using our fair decision trees framework. Using now these learned values, we can plug them into our prescriptive trees framework to generate candidate policies. And from these candidate policies, evaluate the performance of our framework. Sorry, that's so many steps involved. Um, um, so now I'm showing the results of actually the preference elicitation itself. So I'm showing online results um, where we can compare to several other methods in the literature. Our approach throughout the slides that I'm going to go over is going to be showing in red. We compare to random elicitation, where we choose pairs of questions at random, to the black, uh, to the approach of 2BI in black. Uh, actually, there's two methods of 2BI. I'm sorry, I forgot to put the date for the other one. One allows for inconsistencies, and the other one does not. And in green, I'm showing the approach of Bertsimas and O'Hare, and in purple, the approach of Sore and Vielma, which is more recent. In this first slide, I'm showing results in terms of worst case regret as we increase the number of queries from 1 to 10 for the case where there's no inconsistencies and for the case with inconsistencies. What we can see is that our approach makes um, recommendations that have far lower worst case regret than existing approaches, um, both in the case of no inconsistencies and in the case of inconsistencies. Naturally, as we have inconsistencies, this really impedes the learning. So we, uh, after a while, we see that we saturate, we can't really get a whole lot more information. In the next slide, here I'm showing what we call worst case true regret. So what we do here is we sample actual agents, which have a true utility. And we look at how good is the recommendation actually for their uh, true utility. And we see that the regret actually converges to zero if I don't have any inconsistencies after about seven queries, contrary to other methods. In the case of inconsistencies, it's a little bit worse the situation, but still uh, um, better than the state of the art. Finally, I'd like to show you results on worst case true rank. So again, here, this is on simulated agents and taking the worst case over those simulated agents. And we can see that after just a few um, uh, questions, seven namely, we're able to consistently, even in the worst case, make recommendations that have a rank of one under no inconsistency and a, rate, and a rank of four to five um, in the case of inconsistency. Of course, you know, we are not optimizing rank. Uh, but it's interesting to see that we, we do well in terms of rank as well. A key question is how, you know, we, I, I talked about inconsistencies, but how can we know how inconsistent the responses of our user are going to be? In a real data setting, right, you can't really know. So what we did here is we study cases where we have misspecified our model of inconsistency and look how good or bad are our recommendations. Uh, and we can see that actually, whether we talk about worst case regret, worst case true regret, or worst case rank, the differences between uh, 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 what, what um, the performance we expected is and the performance we get is, is actually fairly small. Uh, the, probably the result that looks the worst here is that in the offline setting, we lose about 2.5 in average true rank if we make a mistake in our model. 
Um, we have deployed this approach. We're collecting data as we speak, but haven't analyzed uh, much of it yet. Basically, we have this online uh, interface uh, where we have deployed it on Amazon Mechanical Turk for the moment, but we're also planning to, planning to make it available uh, kind of online for anyone to play with, very much in the spirit of the MIT Moral Machine. Uh, and uh, uh, we look forward to sharing our findings through that. So what we're doing here is basically people enter and they're randomly assigned to a random or um, to, a, to a group where they're asked queries at random and a group where they're asked queries according to our framework so we can compare the performance of the two approaches. Uh, indeed, random did actually quite well uh, in, in the experiments I showed you. Are there any questions before I move on to the second part of my talk, which should take approximately 10 minutes? All right, well, I'll move on. So, um, so this, the second part of my talk is concerned with something very different, namely biodiversity conservation. And this is work, work led by my PhD student, Ying Xiaoye, and my undergraduate student, uh, Chris Doring, and done in collaboration with someone you all know very well, uh, Angelos Yoriyu. So the motivation uh, for, for this work is um, the unprecedented uh, uh, rates at which uh, species are becoming extinct. We all hear this uh, uh, all the time, unfortunately, in the news at the moment. And, and um, the sad thing about this is that uh, this is really due to, to us, to humans. Uh, the main cause indeed of uh, a, a species extinctions is uh, what is called human-induced degradation, meaning uh, we go, we build cities, we build roads. This um, uh, makes the natural habitats on which these animals rely disappear. Uh, and, and this is not only tragic, just because we uh, see animals that we are so used to, uh, you know, it, we know and we're familiar with disappear, but actually it's also impacting uh, hum the life of humans on Earth. So uh, it can also have bad consequences for us directly. Uh, so for this work, we're partnering with uh, Dr. Hugh Robinson, who's uh, uh, Panthera's Director of Applied Science. So Panthera is an organization that's dedicated to preserving uh, wild cats, such as the jaguar. And so with Hugh, what we decided is that, you know, we need to consider a specific case study, kind of. So, so in Hugh's opinion, we should focus on saving the, the jaguar in, say, Central and Latin America. Why the jaguar? Why just a single uh, animal? Uh, well, because the jaguar is what is called an umbrella species, such that if you preserve the jaguar, actually you will uh, preserve a whole lot of other species and, uh, and you will have ultimately preserved uh, biodiversity. Um, excuse me, I'm getting something in the chat. Um, okay, good. Uh, Utsav, I'll answer, I'll answer this question at the end, if that's okay, since it relates to the previous uh, project. Um, all right, so, um, so what is a key strategy for preserving biodiversity? Um, the idea is that we can uh, purchase or ease uh, certain pieces of land, okay? Uh, so conservation organizations go and they select which parcels of land they want to protect and this ensures that these parcels will never become developed. The challenge, though, is that the budget to help um, a, a, a purchase these, these, these pieces of land is only made available over time. Okay, so, so we, we know how much we will get in time period one, year two, year three, and so on. Also, the issue, though, is that we have uncertainty in which parcels will become developed if we don't protect them, right? So let's say I go in time period one, I protect a piece of land. Anything I don't protect risks becoming developed, right? Time period two, I, pres I protect some more stuff, some of the things that have not been developed yet. I can't protect things that have been developed. Anything I don't protect risk be becoming, risks becoming developed and so on and so forth. So there's this uncertainty in projected human land use. And I wanna emphasize here that this uncertainty is actually endogenous, right? What I'm gonna protect, it can no longer become developed. Right. And on the other hand, there's like this mirror thing that if nature develops something, uh, uh, I can no longer protect. It. OK, so it's a bit of a, a game you can think about. It. Now, uh, I, I would like to argue that in this problem, it's very important to be robust to this uncertainty, because anything we lose, any parcel that becomes developed, we, 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 we we're going to lose it forever. Right. There's no way of going back. 
Um, at the same time, we have some data to help inform kind of which parcels are more or less likely to become developed. And so we should use that data. And at the same time, we want to make sure that our conservation plans are, adapt, are going to adapt to um, whichever parcels are becoming developed, to the information we have, basically. So now you're probably wondering, OK, Phoebe, are you the first one to think about this problem? And the reality is not at all. There is actually a huge machinery for making these decisions. And the most popular approach for deciding which pieces of land to protect is uh, this software called Marksan. And Marksan is based on optimization, on integer optimization in particular, and it proceeds as follows. It, it solves this problem here. For each parcel, uh, it can decide whether it's going to protect it or not. Uh, it wants to minimize the cost of conservation, right? So we want to uh, see is the cost of uh, saving parcel I. Um, and uh, it has some constraints on how many animals of each type J we want to save. So each, each parcel has um, a, a certain number of, uh, of animals of uh, a species J, and it, want, it wants to make sure that it saves at least uh, TJ of them uh, um, by, 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 by uh, purchasing those parcels. So it's wonderful. I'm really happy to see that Mark San is based on optimization. This was a really exciting finding for me. However, um, I'd like to argue that this is not necessarily the problem we want to solve because of this issue of uncertainty that I mentioned to you. So if um, you know this is going to protect parcels that may have very few, uh, sorry, very many animals there and that are very cheap, although they may have a very small chance of getting developed, right? So it's very important to think about uncertainty, but then it's also important to think about this endogenous nature of uncertainty that really I'm playing a game, right? That whatever I protect, it can no longer become developed. So the probability of development matters, so we'd, we'd like at least to have a model that somehow takes this into account, okay? So let me now move on to our problem formulation. So this is going to be a, a dynamic problem, right? We're making decisions over time. At each period t, I can decide on xit, which will be one if and only if I have protected parcel i on or before time t. And uh, at each between each period, then we have uncertainty that's revealed. Xi it will be one if and only if parcel i is developed on or before time t, OK? So now the next slide is going to be scary, but I'm going to parse it for you. I promise it's going to make sense at the end. So here, this is the formulation of our conservation problem. Let's see. The decisions are the x variables I mentioned earlier, which we model as adaptive variables that are functions of the history of development decisions that are, or development uncertainties. The first constraint is our budget constraint that says uh, uh, the, the, the cost of the parcels that I develop, that I protect between time t minus one and t should be at most bt. This constraint here stipulates that if a parcel has been developed, I can no longer protect it. And this constraint stipulates that if I've protected the parcel at time t minus one, it must remain protected at time t. What's our goal? Our goal is a bit different. It's going to be to minimize the worst case loss of biodiversity. What do I mean by loss? So here we're going to look at the end of our planning horizon, which parcels have been developed, and we're going to count their value, which means basically how many animals they have there, right? how many jaguars are present there, as our loss. Okay? And we want to try to minimize this worst case loss. Let's now look at what the worst case is taken over. So in the worst case, uh, in, uh, our uncertainty set is going to take the following form. First of all, we have some, something that models how uncertainty uh, spreads, right? How, how, how development spreads. And then we have a constraint that stipulates that if a parcel has been protected, it can no longer become developed in the future, right? So this is the complement of this constraint, basically. Okay. Now, this problem is quite hard. It's a multi-stage binary uh, adaptive problem with policy-dependent uncertainty set. Policy-dependent because these variables x are uh, functions. 
It involves uncertainty in the constraints, making it even harder. So intuitively, it's, it's really nasty. However, we show that we can obtain an equivalent reformulation that does not have any uncertainty in the constraint and that does not involve any decision dependence, provided we adjust the way in which we account in the uncertain in the objective function in the following way. We're going to basically only account for losses in parcels that occur uh, before I have a chance to protect them. So by changing this way of accounting, we now have something that is still hard, but is somewhat simpler, that does not have any decision dependence nor any constraint uncertainty. And this problem uh, uh, can be solved at least with off-the-shelf methods like k-adaptability and whatnot. Um, so let me take two minutes. I know I'm a little bit behind to show you some results. So we use data from uh, uh, shared uh, with us by Hugh uh, that consists in a mean temperature, mean precipitation, canopy, and many more things uh, uh, for each of the parcels we consider protecting, which are anything shown with a little square here. We have uh, uh, Jaguar density information for each of the parcel. And uh, we uh, use uh, these data elements in order to estimate the annual cost of protecting the parcel based on the model from Paul Form and Al. We also obtain uh, development threat data, so the chance that the parcel will become developed on its own from the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center. We use this data to build our uncertainty set using a simulation approach based on what is called the cellular automata model, which is a model that's very well accepted for simulating development in uh, uh, ecology. How do we do this? We uh, first must define neighborhoods in our uh, parcels, and we do this using a clustering approach. So we cluster parcels based on their threat level and based on their covariates. The idea being that parcels who are in the same neighborhood are more correlated in how they will get developed intuitively, right? If this parcel gets developed, then its neighbor is likely to get developed if they have similar characteristics. From this simulation model, we obtain uh, estimates PI for the probability that each parcel will become developed. Uh, and we use this approach now to build our uncertainty set. So this uncertainty set says, Effectively, this is the key constraint in the uncertainty set. It says that we want to consider all scenarios that have a likelihood of at least lambda of materializing. Okay. Let me now show you very quickly some uh, preliminary results based on this model. On the left, we're showing the number of Jaguars in the protected parcels. This is, so what we see here is that Marksan, the existing methods, uh, has a lot more Jaguars in the parcels it protects, right? It makes sense, that's what it optimizes for. However, I would like to argue that we don't care about that at all. What we care is about the number of Jaguars in the parcels that have not been developed somehow, right? Uh, so because we care about not losing Jaguars to, uh, uh, to, to human degradation. And what we can see is that our approach now loses a lot fewer Jaguars, right? Um, by following this metric, which arguably is what is what we want. I'm going to skip the results on connectivity in the interest of time, and I'm going to wrap up um, by uh, hoping that I convinced you that we need to do new research in data-driven optimization to address important societal problems. Uh, I hope that I got you a bit excited about working with community partners, not only because we can make a, a positive impact through our work, but also because they actually uh, help us identify research questions in our field. Um, there's so many more use inspired research questions that we're working to address in our lab. These relate to data uncertainty, to distribution uh, shifts, to missing data, like Hoda was mentioning earlier, and to observational uh, um, uh, nature of the data sets that we're working with. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge funding support from many organizations. I'm going to skip the slides on references, and I'm happy to come back to them. And very last point, I'd like to advertise a conference we're organizing at the interface of uh, 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 AI, ML, Operations Research, and Constraint Programming. Uh, this is a growing conference that I think is relevant for many of us uh, here. Uh, if you work at the intersection of these fields, um, uh, please consider submitting your papers. 
Uh, there will also be a very exciting masterclass on bridging the gap between ML and optimization organized by Elias Khalil and Adam Elmashtub. Uh, uh, the details are already out. Uh, I'll be happy to share the link in the in the chat um, after the talk. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. And sorry for being late. <laughs> thank you very much, Phoebe. Maybe a quick question, is the event uh, virtual or in person? Uh, so we're organizing this in LA and the plan is that it will be in person. However, we will have also support for uh, virtual attendance. Uh, we really hope to be able to hold it in person. We've uh, made reservations at a hotel uh, called Maya in Long Beach. So it will be uh, by the seaside, uh, you know, in the summer. So it should be, should be a lot of fun. <laughs> as tempting as you can make it during a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> good, well, good luck. Uh, any question from the audience on the, on the presentation? I know Utsav have a question. Yeah, Maybe uh, I can start by addressing minutes. that. Sure. So it's a, the question is, I'm going to read it before answering it. It says, I was wondering if you don't have access to RCT, then how does a methodology ensure that the outcomes are indeed a result of a treatment? Very good. So uh, let me go to that slide for a second. And thank you for your question and stuff. So uh, we are making uh, the standard assumptions in causal inference that treatment a K is assigned using only the observed covariates Xi, a, and that any individual with, uh, so this is the conditional exchangeability assumption. And the second assumption is that a, any, no matter what your covariates are, you have a positive probability of getting any given treatment. So this positivity assumption. A, a natural question you could ask is, are these assumptions reasonable in our data set? Uh, it's not possible to check them, so it's hard to say. Um, my, my intuition is that they hold more or less. So they hold more or less, why? Because the covariates XI is not all that we have recorded uh, in our data and the policy that is supposedly used, so the recommended policy for allocating uh, uh, housing resources is only based on those covariates, uh, namely on a score that depends on those covariates. Uh, the reality is a little bit different in that we have this uh, person here that's meant to represent the case manager. Uh, a case manager may have information about an individual other than what is recorded in the data. And so that may mean that our assumption does not hold. Um, I think it holds more or less is my intuition. Again, there's not really possible to... to uh, to check what we are doing uh, as part of this very large project that we have with LASA, that is an interdisciplinary project with people in uh, at the California Policy Lab uh, and, at, and at other universities across the US, is that uh, we are making recommendations on how to change both the way in which the data is gathered and uh, uh, the, the set of data that is gathered. Uh, so ultimately, one of the recommendations is to, um, a, to, to add information on case manager decisions to, uh, to the data that is collected so that, you know, that is also there for record so that then you can be confident that you have access to all the information. Um, this is kind of the best we can do right now. There are methods for um, doing, uh, you know, things that are robust to unobserved confounders. Um, it, I have found in uh, trying them that, I, that they don't really work well. Um, and I'm happy to discuss that uh, more certainly, but, um, but I feel right now that this is the best we can do to, to kind of make these assumptions. Thanks. D did I answer your question, Nansaf? Yeah, thank you very much. Anyone else has a question? We have maybe one or two minutes. Uh, Eugene, oh, Eugene, raise the hand. Oh, hi. Uh, hi. I have a quick question on the second part of the presentation mm -hmm. uh, where you talk about the biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So, your original formulation involves some decision dependent uncertainty, but you show that it can be uh, removed with, I mean, decision independent uncertainty. So, can you tell me more uh, insights about how this reformulation has been obtained? Yeah, sure. So uh, uh, let me clarify one thing. So this reformulation 
only works uh, for some uh, classes of uncertainty sets mm -hmm. uh, that, however, uh, uh, are quite broad. In particular, um, there's uncertainty sets, um, you know, that take the form, the sum of CI, XI, I less than some budget gamma. So these are fairly standard in, in robust optimization, and this reformulation would hold true for, for any uncertainty set of that class. I'd like to point out that the uncertainty set that we use, uh, which is uh, here, uh, does not satisfy this assumption. This, when the assumption is not satisfying, we obtain a conservative approximation, but we see still that this reformulation ends up in practice, uh, you know, yielding uh, significant benefits, although it's conservative. Uh, now, going back to your like uh, the, the heart of your question, where does this come from? So let's try and uh, maybe parse this objective function. So, so remember the original one, I'm going to go back for a moment. It looked like this, right? It looks only at the end of the planning horizon. Uh, and it, uh, you, you, you pay your price, which is the value of the parcel that has been developed. So for which Xi IT is one, okay? Let's look at this one, what it does. So this sum over i of the vi is exactly the same. So what changes is this thing at the interior. And so what we'd like this thing to do is to be one wherever, uh, whenever and we have a bad, um, a, a bad outcome, right? That, that actually the parcel became developed. So intuitively what we want to do is to only count developments that happen um, a, before we had a chance to protect the parcel, okay? So here x i t minus one will be one only if I've already protected the parcel at time t minus one, right? Or any time before it. If I haven't, I'm gonna incur this cost, which is basically the cost that oh, the parcel actually became developed at that time, which is that this difference is one. So it's, it's fairly intuitive, but somehow this adjustment now says, ah, it doesn't matter. You, you could actually be protecting things that are already developed, for example. So you could be violating really this constraint, but it doesn't matter because it's not going to help you in the objective. It's not going to add anything for you. Hmm. Does that answer your question, Eugene? Uh, oh, yes, 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 yes. Thank you very much. So, so that means if you have some additional constraints on the XIT, like for example, if you have like the upper and lower bound for the, the sum of the XIT over I, then it should also be uh, fine for this reformulation. Uh, yes, yeah, that's okay. my intuition. Although we have only showed it for this formulation. So my intuition is yes, but we haven't proven it for the general context. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Uh, well, it's 3.33, so I think we should uh, sure. officially close the session, but we can still uh, have discussions and question answer following the, yeah. the moment we start the recording. Uh, thank you again, uh, Phoebe, for this great talk. It was really interesting. I'm really happy someone was presenting on preference elicitation during the <laughs> workshop. <laughs> I, I hope you continue in this direction. Yeah, 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 definitely. Mm -hmm.